that they are individuals who have depended upon themselves, their jobs, their savings, uh, all that, those sufficient things, and, and maybe not have depended on you the way that they should have. And so we say, God, that we have a different perspective on how you are God that comes through in the midnight hour, God that opens closed doors, a God that blesses us even when we don't see a method of a blessing coming. It does not prevent you, God. A job does not stop you from blessing us. Uh, uh, good health does not stop you from giving us long life and longevity. And so God, you are a God that does against the norm and we're asking God that you would help increase our faith. Help us to understand, trust you, and look and understand that you are the provider of all humanity. Not just those that are Baptists or those that are in church, those that are believers. You said in your word that you ran on the just as well as the unjust, which is simply says that the text helps us to understand whether we're serving you or not, you're still good. And so your goodness is not predicated upon our relationship or lack thereof with you. Your goodness is because you're just a good God. No matter what we are, where we stand, how we're worshiping, if we're not worshiping, whether we mention your name, whether we're selfish, you wake us up every morning, let the sun shine on our face, give us mercy and grace, energy, ability to get up, get down, get in the bed, out of the bed, go downstairs, open up the door, and buy food there. God, you are just a good God. When it gets cold, you give us heat. When it's hot,
great kids out there. You know, that's a, such a, a profound uh, song with great lyrics. And, and, uh, my description of his greatness won't match your description of his greatness because God in different ways and we thank God for what he's doing and I'm just glad today that each of us can say God is great in various ways in all of our life. And so let's bless the Lord again to say that God has just shown himself great in the lives of the saints today. Let me briefly just pause right here. We're going to get right back into the worship service for some announcements. Uh, I just want to share one. The Emily Lumia chapter of the Seventh Day Sorority Incorporated will award two one thousand dollars scholarships for two African American high school seniors who will be attending the college in school year 2020 2021. Applications are available in our church office right here at Shadow Baptist Church. The deadline for submissions for this application is the 16th of May. You don't have a lot of time. 16th of May. Y'all know what I've said before. Don't get it on the 17th and try to ask my I'm only on the 16th. No, get it in on time. If you have any questions, please see because Brittany Williams want to thank you. Amen. I uh, spoke with our, our chairpersons, our co chairpersons for our church anniversary uh, due to our COVID 19. Uh, we will be not be celebrating our church anniversary as we traditionally do on the third Sunday in the month of May. We will not be celebrating. We're going to postpone it hopefully until a later day in the year. I believe we're going. It's a wonderful time to give celebration. So the church ought to always be celebrated. I believe that there's two anniversaries that always should be celebrated at the church: the pastor's anniversary and the church anniversary. Amen. And so we're going to do that a little bit later uh, in the year. We're just going to thank God for that. I just also want to announce that our Bible study will start this Wednesday at 6 p.m. We're going to go through conference call. We're going to use the same number we use for the prayer line. And that number is area code 605-475-4832. 605-475-4832. Access code 539482. It is my hope and prayer that no later than Monday evening or Tuesday we should have the lesson up uh, on our website and Facebook so that you can have it prior to our conference call on Thursday, on Wednesday, so that we can have it in hand as uh, many of you will join us. So join us this Wednesday as we uh, delve into the word of the Lord, uh, as we take an opportunity to see what God has to say to the church. Amen. Uh, we want to thank God for all of you. At this time, let's go right back into the praise and worship as our praise team. Come on, praise team. Give God some praise today. Y'all are just leading us in worship in an awesome way. Put your hands together. Let's bless the Lord one more time.
continue to just go to the Lord for the help that is needed. So I want to invite you back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, uh, two verses 13 and 14. You know it, but I want to read it for uh, continuity uh, to the text. Uh, it says again in King James Version, if I shut up heaven, that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name uh, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. <clears throat> Today, um, I want to be, do the best I can, do the best I can. This is uh, such a beautiful piece of scripture. I want to do the best I can with trying to condense uh, the points that I want to just make and, and move on from there. <clears throat> uh, in, in these verses today, uh, we see very clearly uh, that verse uh, 13 is the cause that if God says if he shuts up heaven, if, if this happens, if that happens, uh, the way to get out of what happens in 13 is in 14, the first part of it. Uh, he, he identifies a few things inside of there that help us uh, to see how to deal with the ills of humanity. So <clears throat> what I want to do today is really take a little opportunity uh, to kind of touch on some things and then I'm going to be moving on to our invitation in communion. But the New Testament Gospels are a proof that God himself uh, gave and purposed uh, John the Baptist the principal charge, the principal charge of preparing uh, the condemned world for the arrival of a sacrificial lamb. A sacrificial lamb, won't you follow me here? Uh, which would be slain for the remission of all of humanity's sins. All the sins that we uh, would in, in inherit, or all the sins that we would commit, would be covered uh, by the sacrificial lamb that is Jesus Christ. Uh, but John preeminently responsibility was to make straight the path of the Lord's coming. That's in Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. <clears throat> that was John's job, was to go about and to let the world know that there is one that is coming, that is the first arrival. Uh, when we, we saw, when we heard about Jesus Christ coming, we knew that there would be one that would come and sacrifice their sins. And now, um, we kind of serve this modern day Preachers, pastors, and teachers uh, all kind of serve that same John like uh, type of the second coming of Christ. The cause is coming again, and God still is sending individuals out there trying to get the world prepared. I, I'm not quite sure um, I, I, what you're thinking of, so I want to be very clear I, and as I'm talking about this text and the relevancy as to really what we are going through right now. I don't want to suggest, like some people have, that this COVID-19 uh, is a curse from God. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting uh, that God sent this uh, to us because there were some people that, there's, that, that have lost their minds. We got so far from God. I am suggesting that this is a time that, that the church, the world, should reflect about its relationship with God. I am suggesting that there is significance when we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 significantly and see where God uh, says to Solomon after Solomon finishes building the temple and that, that even if, if heaven is shut up and there's no rain and even if pestilence comes, uh, God responds to Solomon and he says to Solomon that if my people will call by my name, if they will do certain things, you know, they would hear from heaven. And, and, and so what I want to suggest today that regardless to what we go through, that in verse 13 says, whatever the problem is, verse 14 says that the solution is there and we can participate in what the solution is. So when John preached the good news of God's kingdom, fulfilling his uh, commission of preparation, John had a simple and fundamental message. And here's what John said. He said, repent. That's what I want you to do. I want you to repent. In other words, repenting is simply defined as you 
not feeling sorry, that's remorse, that's remorse. Repenting is actually several actions. It is recognizing you did wrong, turning from what you did, and don't go back the same way you came that caused you to get in a scuffle with the Lord to begin with. And so what he's simply saying that I want you to change your lifestyle because if you turn from who you are, I want you to really turn in from who you are or were into your destiny. And that's what John is saying. So his message of repent was transformative to those that heard about what John had to say about a king that was coming. He said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here right now. Although God had not arrived, the kingdom is on its way. Matthew chapter 3, verse, uh, excuse me, 3 and 2. However, he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins as the foundation of the message of the gospel. In other words, when you hear the word, there is a symbolism that we go through being baptized from our sins that is a washing away that brings us closer to God and further away from who we used to be. Watch, follow with me now. As fundamental as the message of John's message was, it was not a message that the church or the world should fall asleep on. I want to share with you that although Jesus came, he is coming back again. I want to share with you that although that we have repented in the first stage to be saved, there is still some repentance that needs to happen because there are some things that may be in this time that I think of reflection that is a wonderful time to try to get a closer relationship with God. And so really what I want to talk about today uh, is a nation called to repent. A nation called to repent. I want to use as a theme, uh, obedience, the condition before deliverance. Obedience, the condition before deliverance. I want to argue that we love deliverance, but we don't like obedience. I want to argue that because most of us want to get out of our mess that we got ourselves in, but we don't want to act right so that we can go back to the same place. And let me suggest this, you don't have enough power to not go back to the same place you've been delivered from unless you are obedient unto God. Right. <clears throat> I, want, I want to argue that today because if we are not understanding that obedience is simply the power that prevents us from going back to the place where the Lord brought us from. And, and, and some of us, I don't know about you, you got to tell nobody your business, but the truth be told, where God brought us from, there's a lot of us that didn't like being where we were. Right. And thus, the only way to prevent from going back there again, we've got to find somebody with this, let me put it like this, my mama and daddy used to tell me, don't listen to me, you don't listen to somebody. Because the reality is, you can only go so far on your home. But the reality is that obedience keeps you from getting into stuff that you can't get yourself out of. Yeah. Let me talk to you this morning. So fundamentally, this message that John had, it was not a message that the church should have slept on then and we shouldn't be sleeping on now. In other words, I, I, I think that while we are home, locked in, it's a good time to exercise your prayer closet. It's a good time to ask God, to God, are you happy with my service unto you? Nobody around looking, nobody around asking no questions. Go on your bedroom with somebody in the house, lock your door, and have a conversation with God and ask God simply, are there any areas of improvement? And, and, and from there, uh, we, we need to know the first thing is repentance. And, and so I want to share that repentance opens the door for a spiritual or divine conversation with God. Ain't no need to jump into this long soliloquy of a prayer if you ain't asked God to forgive you first. Uh, John's message was a breath of sobering reality for God's creation that whether they were aware of it or not had grown apart from the creator. I want you all to stick with me because I, I want us to see that we have, that there is a distance that we grow apart from God. I want to argue that, that 
we know right from wrong, but trying to get us to do right can be a challenge sometimes. Thus, what had continued to separate them from, uh, from each other, which is sin, us from God, needed a solution for a damned relationship. The solution was Jesus coming into the world to save men from their sins. There are scriptures that confirm that God is far more, listen to me, God is far more concerned with the lack of relationship with his creation than his creation is concerned with him. Let me say that again. There are scriptures that confirm that God is far more concerned with the lack of relationship with his creation than his creation is with him. In other words, there's proof that God loves us although we are disconnected from God. That God wants us to, wants to pay more attention to us, but the fact that we don't want to get right with him means that there's a major problem. Let me share with you a few scriptures that I, I just want to share that I think that will help us to argue this point about a need for a national call for repentance. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 4 and 5. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, and they, and, excuse me, and the children of Judah together, with a continual weeping, they shall come, and seek the Lord their God. They ask the way to Zion, with their faces toward it, saying, Come, let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 45. In Ezekiel chapter 36, 25 to 29, it says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be, you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I'll give you and listen to what he says. Look at what God is doing. I'll, I'll cleanse you first. Then he says, I'll give you a new heart. Put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone uh, of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Uh, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell. Listen to him. Here comes the sunshine. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people. I'll be your God. I will listen to the word. He said, I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. I will call for the grain and the multiply it and bring no famine. God is just awesome in what he does. He's looking for us to get back in relationship with him. I want to argue, is it possible that now God is using this time to help us to look at the reality of stuff. You know that we were so busy before. We were doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, this, and you know when the weather gets good, we're just busy doing whatever we want to do. And church is something that we do when we can fit it in our schedule. Is it possible that God is tired of us going to football games, soccer games, softball games on Sunday, and then we're missing for a month of Sundays, and then we catch up with God when we can? Is it possible that our lifestyles have changed so much from our rearing and upbringing that we have walked away from God in some context, and God is saying, listen, you cannot afford to be away from me this long. Is it possible that your morning prayers have been slightly forgotten? Is it possible that your noonday prayers ain't in your, in your diet anymore? And is it possible that you're too tired from the rest of the day that you fall asleep before you fall on your knees? Is it possible that we need to come together and pray? Right. I want to argue today, beloved, that it's necessary for us to understand that obedience comes before deliverance. God has a way out. God has a way to get you out of where we are. 
God has an answer to get us out of COVID-19. Uh, but is it possible that God is looking for his people back again? Is it possible that we've been absent from the family? Is it possible that we haven't been what we should have been? Is it possible that our name need to be called in a row on church Sunday morning? And because we're not there, God don't know where you are. But the reality is God always knows where you are, but spiritually you are apart from him. Is it possible today, beloved, that we only come in contact with God out of necessity to get ourselves out of trouble? I'm going to share with you, God is, God is a God that loves us and he will deliver us. But God wants us to have a relationship with him. There's a few things inside of this text. In verse 14, I just want to point out that I'm done. And we will go into the communion, and I think it's very important. But the first thing that he brings out in verse 14, uh, that it's better for humility to come from within than to come from without. Let me help you understand what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> Regardless of how you look at humility, humility is a tough process. Whether you do it or God causes something in your life to happen to lower you from where you are to where he needs you to be. Uh, it's, and let me help somebody to understand it. it's better for you to humble yourself than for God to humble you. Yes. Uh, let me put it another way. I know some of you all have been catching this. Um, in, in other words, what, what the text is saying, he opens by the text in verse 14 says, if my people. So in other words, the first part of the text suggests that there's a relationship. A relationship knows that I know. So let me take this to where I live. Uh, my mom and daddy who raised me. I knew the rules of the house. I knew what I was supposed to do. One of the rules of the house is that my mother should never make it home from work and my chores ain't done. And if my chores were not done and I was playing and watching TV and doing all this other stuff, first thing you do when you come home, you change out these school clothes. And then you get into your play clothes which were your work clothes, and you did what you were supposed to do. You better not let mama catch you but your work undone. <clears throat> and, and so if your work was undone, you know, she would talk to you in such a way that had some aggression to it. Now, uh, talking does not necessarily necessitate that you use words all the time. Let me help you understand that God talks to us and he don't use words all the time. So my mom didn't use words all the time. She used tension cords, racing tracks, I had to go out and get my own switch and braid and bring it and leave it before I came back in. Y'all don't know nothing about that. That's all right. Uh, but, but then she would talk to me. She would talk to me. She would talk to me sometimes softly, sometimes very vigorously. She would talk to me. And after she got finished with her conversation, I knew very clearly what she meant. And she didn't have to have that problem. But yet there was a, I, I was her, I was her child. And so she she punished me because I should have known better. Because I'm her son. And she's my mother. She knows me. In other words, you know how God is. There's expectation that God has of each of us. If my people, listen, you ain't been Christian for no reason. You're not a Christian to do what you want to do. You're a Christian because there's a change of life that should happen in you. And God wants that his people should be called by his name. Now listen, you don't go somewhere and embarrass Ella Harris in public and be her child. You, you don't do that. You don't do that. You, you're not going to, she would tell us before we leave home, you ain't going to embarrass me in public because right when you embarrass me, I'm going to talk to you again. And she did that. She did that. And sometimes she took me to the lady's bathroom and talked to me very vigorously inside of church. Now listen, it was a it was a mark on who she was. She counted it as an insult to who she was that her child acted improper in public because her name meant something. I want you to know that while you're out there being away from God, being a Christian and being away from the church means that you don't relish the name. By the name of Jesus, demons behave. Nobody don't hear me in here. In the name of Jesus, enemies become your footstool. In the name of Jesus, ways are made. Your name is important. And treating your name like it don't mean nothing ain't good sense. And so with Jesus, with Solomon, 
and is told by God that if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. In other words, God is saying to Solomon, you know what you should be doing. If you want to get back in relationship, if the heavens are shut up, the pestilence is in the land, do what you're supposed to do because you know who you are and you know what your name is. So God tells Solomon, he says, listen, if, if these people would humble themselves, if they would come down from their high horse, they know that they ain't one but sits high and look low, that's me. And, and, and I don't share that with anybody else other than my son and the Holy Spirit. And so he says, one, that you need to humble yourself from without, uh, within, before I come and do it. And we suggest, and I'm going to move on, that when God humbles us, it's better for you to do than for God to move. God, and listen, when God takes it, I don't know about you, when I got on punishment, my mother told me how long I was on punishment for. And when God removes something, he don't necessarily tell you you're going to get it back in a week or in two weeks. God gives it back when and if he's ready to return. Humble yourself. God wants a relationship with you. Two, pursue God with all you have. Pursue him. Seek my face. Seek my face. That's what he wants you to do. Go after him. Let him know that you love him. Pursue him. There are at least four reasons that we pursue God. Four reasons, I'm going to let you know about that, we'll move on. First reason is in order to know him better. One of the reasons we pursue God is that we know, want to know him better. We don't want to just feel uh, the music, we want to live the life that the music we're singing about. We want to live the power of the prayer that we're praying with. And so in one way, uh, we, we, we want to pursue God because we're pursuing him to get to know him better. We want to know his habits. We want to know his will. We want to know what God wants from us. God just don't want you to come and get to feel good. God wants you to know that he loves you, although you don't get the love you should get from humanity. God wants you to know that I'm going to leave you nor forsake you. God wants you to know that about him too. Uh, um, he, he wants us to confirm our justification. One, one, that we're justified by faith. In other words, because Christ came in our life, we are justified by faith. In other words, you didn't do anything to get a relationship with God because God loved you. He spilled his blood. He justified himself. So when we repent and we're forgiven of our sins, we're made just with God. In other words, we're made right in relationship with God. So and then finally, we need to understand in point two is stop penalizing yourself for stuff that God has taken away. If the church would listen, the church talks and preaches a forgiveness that a lot of times it don't even give itself to confirm justification. One, we should know him better. But yet in three, we ought to perfect our imperfections. One, we're spending more time learning his word, understanding his word, helps us to get better at him daily. We pursue God because we want to turn our imperfections into perfections. In other words, you got to spend some time on your stuff to get your stuff to change. I know some of y'all don't believe that, 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 we, that we can just wake up and God do it. No, God wants us to participate in this, use his power, his knowledge to work on the things in our life. And yet number four, finally, because we are heavenly bound. There, there's a place we're going after we leave this earth. I don't care what any scientists say. I don't care what any philosophers say. I don't care what believers, non-believers, astrologers say. That there is, there is a heaven. There is some mansions that have not been made by hands, according to John chapter 14, that we will inherit. That's the reason why Christ left the way. And then yet finally, our final point for this morning is three. Turn from our evil ways. Turn from our evil ways. I want you to look at somebody and if you ain't got nobody to look at, look in the mirror. And I want you to understand that person you see in the mirror, tell them to turn from your evil ways. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Turn from your evil ways. Now listen, husbands, be careful what you say to your wives. Just look at them. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Just look at them. Every one of us, every one of us, according to the text, 
has some ways that God does not care for. And here's, in order to get out of the situation, God is requiring righteousness. Look at what he's saying in verse 13. He says, regardless of what happens, if you do this, you will hear from heaven. I will heal the land. You will hear from heaven when he will heal the land. I know we're waiting on a vaccine, but there's a word from heaven about our situation. But there is some turning. There is some repenting. There are some things that we need to do. And so in order to be delivered, we got to be obedient unto God today. Beloved, let me share with you, and I'm finished when I say this, that this season that we're in is a time where we've got to reflect on who we are. This is not a time to look at somebody else and what they did. I don't want you to get caught up in our president, Congress, or the government. I don't want you to get caught up in the doctors. I don't want you to get caught up in anybody else. This is one time you need to get caught up in you and say, what can I do to get closer to the Lord that loves me more than I love myself? Let me say that one more time. I want to get closer to the God that loves me more than I love myself. God is calling this nation, this world to repent. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. God is calling us to a higher call. Amen. And by the looks of things, God ain't playing. By the looks of things, this situation ain't no joke. By the looks of things, times are critical. And by the looks of things, I ain't putting nobody's government down. This government can't do you still the way Jesus can do you. And by the looks of things, every one of us need to get right with God. Just like they used to say in the old church, get right with God and do it now. Down at the cross where he shed his blood, get right, get right with God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today as you're calling the nation, the world, to a relationship that you rightfully have the right to call them to. Genesis tells us in the beginning, God created this world. God created the heavens and the earth. God created humanity. God created and spoke, and there was. He spoke, and there was. He, he divided the earth from the seas. He spoke, and it was. The heavens from its firmament. He spoke, and it was. God has a, an a relationship that he's calling us to. I pray today, God, that we will see the signs of that we are in our last days and that we will get this relationship with the Lord together so that we understand that God is calling through the peacefulness. God is calling. Never in our lifetime have we ever seen such devastation such as this. There is a greater, greater, grander understanding that there is a spiritual need for us to get right with God. I pray, God, that you will bless those that stand in need for a relationship. As we open the doors of the church today, God, I pray that you would receive those who need you in such a desperate way. Receive them, God, without our judgment. So many times the church judges those and puts them down. Uh, it's hard for people to come as they are when that can't even get through the doors of judgment, can't get to the seat, can't walk up because eyes are judgment. God, let them just come. I've always said this, and I continue to say that if you need us, we're here. We open our hearts to you, shout out for this church to you. Contact us, 814-453-4909. You can write us, 91 East 5th Street, here we be at, 16507. You can go to us in our Faith Life app, uh, which is on our web page. However, you need to get in contact with us. Listen, I need to talk to Pastor Harris. I want to become a Christian. I want to become saved. I need to reconnect back with the church. These are the last days. I don't want to see you lost. I don't want to see you lingering out there. Whatever you've gone through, it's time now to get it right with God. Listen, focus on your relationship with God and watch everything else happen. I'll say this and I'm done. Verse that I accepted the Lord on when I was 14 years old. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, all of 
these things shall be added unto you. In other words, God wants you to put him first. And when you put God first, God will never forget you. He'll never leave you somewhere without having a blessing to meet you before you get there. God bless you. We pray heaven smile upon you. Uh, at this time, I want to share again that we can continue to do our giving unto the Lord uh, through our various things. And I didn't mention that earlier. Uh, again, www.shadow.erie.org. You can text to give 814 258 6362. You can go to Faith Mike. You can give there. You can mail your payments. I gave you the address. I'll give it again. 901 East Fifth Street, APA 16507. Beloved, be with us on Tuesday and Thursday, 7 to 8 p.m. We are having a grand time talking with heaven, hearing from God through our prayer call. You can use the phone number that I provided for you. And then we will see you on Wednesday at 6 o'clock for our Bible study. Amen. As we thank God for this opportunity and so many that have love of the Lord, I want to share with you today that it's significant and important that as we go through our first Sunday uh, and as we traditionally do our communion, we're not able to be together as we would normally be together. But I want to share with you today that if you have uh, juice and crackers inside of the house, we want to consecrate it as if you are really here inside of the church and pray. God will cover that even as we are praying for it so that we can share in the Lord's body. We may not physically be together, but what great thing is it that we should be together spiritually on one accord. I'm going to bow at this time and we want to pray for a moment that if there's anything that is between you and your relationship with God, we want you to repent right now. Ask God to forgive you. And don't be afraid of the blessings that God has for you in getting closer to Him. Let us pray. Father, as we come together on this day, this first Sunday in May, ask your consecrated blessing upon this wine that we have in our hands, whether we're in the church house, or whether we're at home, whether we're at work, wherever we are, viewing this broadcast, touching God in such a way that as we collectively come together to worship you, we thank you for who you are. Now, God, let us take in perspective, looking within ourselves, and let us not partake of this if we don't have a good relationship with you. Let us pause right now and ask your forgiveness. Let us repent. Not feel remorse, but repent. That is, take into consideration what we're doing. Realize what we're doing and wrong and turn from it, never to return to it again. Walk away because you want us to be clean without a spot or a wrinkle. You said God for us to examine ourselves and that's what we desire to do. So through this examination, not of our own desire, but of the word of you, and based on the prayers that we're praying right now, let that examination wash us and cleanse us as you forgive us. Then God, let we may be right to receive the body and the blood of our Lord Savior Jesus Christ. Touch it as we pray, it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, uh, it was on the night in which our Lord was taken in captivity, and he took bread and broke it and he ate it. And as he consumed of the, the body, he poured some wine into a cup, reminded the disciples that this is the blood of the New Testament that was shed for sins of many. And as he shares his blood, we now drink as they did in the upper room. Lord, have mercy on us. For we are your children, we are down here in a challenging time. As we leave this place, God, we are told that we should be confined. But I pray, God, on our ways home as we are trying to social distance ourselves. 
that we're praying past every house, every store, every bar, every corner, every shopping mall that we pass. That the Spirit of God will permeate these places while our feet and our cars travel. That the Spirit of God will leave no place untouched, no person not saved, no individual not covered. May we take the mission of Jesus Christ and the mission of the church ever so seriously that as we love you and we recognize you sacrificed your life for us, we pray, oh God, as we leave this place that we never leave your presence. It is in the master's name of Jesus we pray. Amen.